Welcome to the Best Interest Podcast, where we believe Benjamin Franklin's advice that an investment in knowledge pays the best interest, both in finances and in your life. Every episode teaches you personal finance and investing in simple terms. Now, here's your host, Jesse Kramer. Hey guys, what's up? This is Jesse Kramer speaking from The Best Interest. Welcome to episode 51 of The Best Interest Podcast. Let's see, I'm recording this on Monday, March 13th. And over the weekend, I got a lot of questions, some from listeners, some from readers, some from clients about Silicon Valley Bank. If you haven't seen Silicon Valley Bank in the news, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna break it down in simple terms. It's gonna be pretty educational. Even just something as basic as how exactly does a bank work? Because I think that most people, including myself up until, you know, a couple years ago, I didn't really understand the business model of banks. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what made Silicon Valley Bank unique in some ways and how that uniqueness led to its failure. We're going to try to keep you as up to date as possible on what's been happening over the last, say, 48 hours. Again, I'm talking to you right now. It is 1.43 p.m. Eastern time. On Monday the 13th, by the time this comes out on Wednesday the 15th, or by the time you listen to it on the 16th or 17th, or maybe over the weekend, things might have changed. We'll see. I've got an article on the best interest that's an article on the blog that I'm trying my best to keep it up to date. So as things come out, I'll try to throw some little updates in there and explain exactly what it means to you. But let's get into the good stuff. Let's talk about what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. Okay, so you're seeing Silicon Valley Bank in the news. People are comparing it to the great financial crisis in 2008, right? Banks are failing. What is going on? So we're going to talk about Silicon Valley Bank in simple terms, and we're going to start with how do banks even work? It's a very simple question, but it's fundamental that we understand that before we can get into the specifics of Silicon Valley Bank. All banks have assets and liabilities. Now, you're probably familiar with both those ideas, even if you don't realize it. The liabilities are deposits, just like the money that you deposit in your savings account. You are a depositor at a bank. I am a depositor at a bank. And since the bank owes us that money back plus interest, it's a liability on the bank's balance sheet. Now, the bank also has assets to offset those liabilities. They come in two forms, loans and securities. So we'll break each of those down. Banks give out personal loans, business loans, mortgage loans, etc. They charge a higher rate to the loan borrowers, say 6%, than they pay to their depositors, say 1%. So that difference, which in this case was 5%, that's called the net interest margin, or NIM, the NIM. And that's the main way that banks make money, right? They take in my and your deposits, And they pay us a small interest rate, but then they take our deposits, they loan them out to someone else, and they charge a higher interest rate. That difference, that NIM, some people call it the spread, that's the way that most banks make money. Okay, but banks, outside of making loans, they can also choose to buy securities using that money, right? Security is just a synonym for a stock, a bond, a REIT. Those are all securities. Most commonly, the securities that banks buy take the form of short-term, high-quality bonds, just like a three-month or a six-month U.S. Treasury bill. Now, most banks perform better when interest rates rise. And the reason why is because they're able to increase their NIM and make more money off of their loans and therefore generate more profit. So the more a bank relies specifically on loans, the better that bank does when interest rates rise. But if a bank relies heavily on securities, specifically on bonds, then the opposite is true. Rising interest rates hurt bond prices, and the bank's bond portfolio will also drop when interest rates rise. And this this is worthy of a quick aside, a quick explanation. Why do bonds drop in value when interest rates rise? Simple explanation. Let's go through it. Let's say that you own a bond right now. It comes due in a year, and it's paying you 2%. Great. Well, guess what, guys? I could go out right now and buy a a one-year bond on the open market that's yielding 4.5%. So a question would be, why would I buy your bond that's yielding 2% if I can just go buy a new one that's yielding 4.5%? 
clearly in this case, your bond is worth less to me than a new bond. It's just simple math, right? It's, it's just, we get it, supply and demand, it, it just makes sense. Your 2% bond is not as appealing to me as a 4.5% bond. So if you're holding 2% bonds, and then you see interest rates rise to 3 4 5%, Everyone's going to want a new bond. They don't want your old bond that's yielding a lower amount. That happens to banks. If a bank is holding a big bond portfolio, and maybe those bonds don't come due for years in the future, and then interest rates rise, the bonds that the bank currently holds are going to be worth less than when they bought them. Granted, the way that bonds work, you're always going to get your money back at the end of the bond term. Bond pricing is kind of intricate. I'm not going to get too much into the details right now, but suffice to say, the reason why banks tend to hold shorter term bonds is because they're less interest rate sensitive, right? Let's say I buy a $1,000 bond and it's yielding 3%, but it comes due in a month. Well, I'm only going to get to capture that 3% interest for 30 days. I'm only going to capture really like a 12th, right? One month out of a year. I'm going to capture a 12th of that interest. And so what? If in the interim, interest rates rise to 4%, my bond really isn't that much affected. I'm going to get a little bit of interest and then collect all my money back, the the $1,000 I put in, I'm going to collect that back at the end of the month. But if a bond has a 10-year term, well, all of a sudden, it's pretty interest rate sensitive because when rates rise from, say, 3% to 5%, that 2% difference is going to be expressed over 10 years of the bond term, not just one month. So. Banks tend to, if they hold bonds, they generally, the cautious thing to do is to hold shorter term bonds. Okay, but let's talk now about Silicon Valley Bank specifically. So Silicon Valley Bank, it's specialized in helping tech companies, really startups, um, some biotech, life science type companies, Silicon Valley, digital tech companies. And the bank itself, it's grown rapidly, especially in recent years because of that focus. It was, you might have seen in the news, the 16th biggest bank in the country. It's a serious bank. Now, most tech companies, many tech companies in recent years have raised large sums of cash through, say, venture capital, private equity, or by going public. And then they have to deposit that cash somewhere. A lot of those deposits have gone to Silicon Valley Bank. Being cash heavy, those tech companies didn't necessarily need loans from Silicon Valley Bank. So Silicon Valley Bank, they've got lots of cash deposits. They don't necessarily have a bunch of loans that they need to be making. So what are they going to do with that extra money? They decided to buy securities. It's what banks do. However, the percentage of loans and the percentage of securities that Silicon Valley Bank held was a bit different than most banks. Most banks tend to be loan heavy. Most of their assets are on the loan side. SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, was unique in that it was securities heavy. Okay, that makes a difference. So as interest rates rose over the past year, a lot of the easy money in venture capital, private equity, it dried up. So many of Silicon Valley's customers, its depositors, those tech companies, they stopped making new deposits into the bank. If anything, they actually started taking money out of the bank, right? I'm sitting on a $10 million, but I got to run my business. I'm not getting any more venture capital. So I'm going to start pulling on that $10 million at Silicon Valley Bank to make payroll, to run my business, all that kind of stuff. If anything, you guys might know this, early stage tech companies, they go through a lot of cash, right? They hemorrhage cash by their nature. So if new money from venture capital or private equity isn't coming in, then it means that Silicon Valley Bank, their total deposits must have been decreasing pretty rapidly. That was true. Over the past 10 years, Silicon Valley Bank's concentration in tech companies, it's been really helpful for their business. It meant tons of new deposits were flowing into the bank. But that concentration is a double-edged sword. And over the past year, those deposits have only been leaving the bank. So now remember, those deposits, they're not sitting in dollar bills in a safe at the bank. Instead, those deposits have been deployed. They've been used as loans to other bank customers, and they've been used to buy securities. If too many depositors need too much of their money back from the bank all at the same time, the bank might be in trouble. They're going to need to take drastic action to raise that cash. And that's what SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, needed to do last week. They needed to raise cash. And what they did was they sold $21 billion, that's billion with a B, they sold $21 billion of their bond portfolio last Wednesday, March 8th. Now, interest rates spiked early last week after Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell, he had a press conference. 
And that interest rate spike, what does that do to bond prices? That hurts bond prices, right? So that lowered the value of Silicon Valley Bank's bonds. They had to sell them anyway to raise cash. And they sold them at an estimated $1.8 billion loss. In other words, they purchased the bonds for about $23 billion weeks and months ago. And then they sold them last week for $21 billion. Now, a $2 billion loss, obviously that's a ton of money especially for a bank, which is generally considered a safe business model. That's a full year of profits, probably more than a full year of profits for Silicon Valley Bank. So for them to lose that much money intentionally by selling their bond portfolio, it raises a really scary question. How much trouble does Silicon Valley Bank, how much trouble are they in to do something so drastic? And then last week, in another attempt to raise money, Silicon Valley Bank, they tried selling some of the shares of their common stock, right? The company itself owns shares of its common stock, and they attempted to sell about 30% of the bank's total value out into the market, which, again, that dilutes current shareholders' ownership by 30%. That in itself is another drastic measure that caused Silicon Valley Bank's stock price to crash, even further than it already was crashing. And that attempt to raise more cash, it ultimately failed. And it begs, again, a similar question to the one we just asked. Why would Silicon Valley Bank sell these shares of stock now at about $200 per share when they tried last week, instead of last year when the bank was valued at six or $700 per share? It reeks of desperation. Now that desperation, that weakness that caused a tidal wave of about $42 billion in attempted withdrawals last Thursday, March 9th alone. So as of close of business on March 9th, Silicon Valley Bank had a negative cash balance of $958 million, with an M, $958 million. It owed depositors $958 million that it didn't have. Now, this is the way that bank runs tend to work. I saw a really good analogy from Ben Carlson in an article I read today. He goes, imagine if you went to Planet Fitness and every single member of the gym showed up at the same time. You'd have a pretty big problem there at the squat rack, right? The way gym memberships work is they only expect, I don't know, 5, 10, 20% of their members to be there at any given time. And that's the way that everybody gets to use the gym. Banks work the same way. They only have a small percentage of the actual cash deposits on hand. Everything else is being loaned out. Everything else is in the form of securities. If everyone comes at once demanding their cash, the bank might be in some trouble. That's a bank run. You might have seen this scene from It's a Wonderful Life. It's a great learning lesson. I'm going to play the audio for you right here. The the money's not here. Well, your money's in Joe's house. That's right next to yours. Uh, you're lending them the money to build, and then they're going to pay it back to you as best they can. Now, what are you going to do, foreclose on them? I got $242 in here, and $242 isn't going to break anybody. But my husband hasn't worked in over a year, and I need money. How am I going to live until the bank opens? I got Dr. Bill's to pay. I need cash. I can't I keep my kids on faith. I'm gonna... When depositors lose confidence in a bank, they want their money back. This compounds the bank's problems even further. It's exactly what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. Now, in the Great Depression, many banks completely failed and it left their depositors hung out to dry. And that's when the federal government decided to step in and they passed the Banking Act of 1933, which created the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC. The FDIC insures bank deposits up to $250,000. So you, me, every American with money at a bank is insured up to $250,000. The FDIC, they stepped in on Friday, March 10th, and they took over Silicon Valley Bank. Depositors at SVB, they are safe, up to $250,000. Recently, on Sunday the 12th, the federal government said, you know what, not only are they safe up to $250,000, they're also safe, basically in full. The federal government is going to make depositors whole. We're going to get into why they did that here in a second. But it's important to realize the federal government is not bailing out the bank itself. The bank is going to cease to exist. It is not going to be operating. If you ran the bank, you are out of a job. If you owned the bank stock, you are not going to get your money back. If you owned one of the bank's bonds, you are not going to get your money back. The federal government is only helping out the depositors at the bank. It is not keeping the bank in business. So this is a nuance there when it comes to the term bailout. 
When a bank fails the way that Silicon Valley Bank failed, there are two ways, two traditional ways that a rescue might occur. The first one, we kind of already talked about it, is that the federal government steps in in some way, perhaps steps in above the $250,000 limit. Perhaps they step in and actually give the bank money to stay in business. That's what happened in the great financial crisis when about $200 billion was given and or loaned to banks to ensure that the banks themselves stayed alive. Now, on Sunday, March 12th, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said that the federal government would not pursue that course of action, meaning the federal government is not going to step in to keep Silicon Valley Bank itself in business, right? Just to reiterate that. They are stepping in, as we found out at around 6.30 on Sunday, March 12th, they're stepping in to fully protect all depositors who, as of today, Monday, March 13th, had full access to their money and no losses associated with the resolution of Silicon Valley Bank would be borne onto the taxpayer. That's another thing. Interesting point here. The federal government is planning on raising money via an assessment against other banks, basically saying, hey, everyone in the banking industry, you have to chip in to make Silicon Valley's depositors whole. I'll be honest with you guys, I'm not really sure how this is going to play out because if I was running a healthy bank and I was doing everything right, I wouldn't feel great about having to chip in to some fund that keeps Silicon Valley Bank alive. They screwed up. Why is it my problem? Anyway, that's something for the federal government and banking regulators to figure out. But let's get to a second possibility, a way that banks could be bailed out. And we'll see what happens this week with Silicon Valley Bank. It might still be possible where a private institution steps in and agrees to buy Silicon Valley Bank, likely at you know pennies on the dollar at a steeply discounted price. This is what happened during the great financial crisis in a few different ways. Famously, Warren Buffett stepped in. He injected cash into Goldman Sachs and into Bank of America in exchange for a large ownership share of those two banks, right? Similar to the way that Silicon Valley Bank really needed cash last week, Goldman Sachs and Bank of America really needed cash during some parts of the great financial crisis. And Warren Buffett stepped in and said, sure, you can have my cash in exchange for ownership. And that turned out to be a wonderful investment for Warren Buffett. Now, famously, Warren Buffett said no to Lehman Brothers, and he said no to AIG. Lehman Brothers failed completely, and AIG ended up getting U.S. federal bailout money. But here's a a good clip of Warren Buffett talking about saying no to Lehman and to AIG. Uh, This goes back a little before the panic. Lehman was looking for money at that time, and they approached Berkshire. I came down to the office uh, at night, Mm made these little notes on here of things that were red flags, and you'll see a number of pages here. And, and you had to get to page 150 or 200, but there was, a, there was clearly a lot of trouble uh, there. By the time I got through, um, I decided that, that uh, we were not in a position to lend money to Lehman. I was still wondering what was going on, obviously, with AIG in New York, but there was nothing to be done. AIG uh, was just going to run out of money, big time. Uh, in the next day or two, and uh, Lehman was going to go under unless something was happening that I didn't know about. The important point is that Silicon Valley Bank depositors and by proxy American depositors as a whole are made to feel confident that they'll receive 100% of their deposits back. Because let's get into this idea of what happens if no sort of bailout were to occur. There's really no good answer. You know, should the federal government have stepped in to bail out Silicon Valley Bank in some way, shape, or form, giving it money to make its depositors whole? It's a hard question. Because if the government does bail out Silicon Valley Bank, which we we saw that they did to some extent, it reinforces the following precedent. Hey, American banks, do whatever the heck you want. Be irresponsible, cut corners, squeeze profits out of your customers, over-concentrate your business. If you screw up, we'll have your back. You'll pay no consequences. Okay, that's a dangerous precedent to set. It's called moral hazard. It's the lack of an incentive to protect against risk. But if the government does not bail out Silicon Valley Bank, then it sends this message. Hey, attention all banks, attention all depositors, all loaners, all investors in bank stocks. 
you are on much thinner ice than you previously assumed. And that outcome could cause a crisis of confidence where perfectly healthy banks are called into question. As Warren Buffett said, fear is extraordinarily contagious, right? How do I know that my bank isn't the next Silicon Valley bank? Maybe I should go to my bank and pull out all my money. So then maybe a second run on a questionable bank occurs, and then a third and a fourth one, but maybe on some safer banks. Next thing you know, boom, 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 the dominoes are falling and banks are failing all over the country. This would be so-called financial contagion, an outcome that would be far worse than any single bank failing. Avoiding that financial contagion, that's a must. And it's 100% the reason why the federal government stepped in in 2008. And it's a big reason why we saw the federal government step in yesterday to save the depositors at Silicon Valley Bank. So now, an important question. Are other banks in trouble? I'm sure some might be, but as we noted earlier, Silicon Valley Bank is unique in a few ways. Those unique features directly led to its failure. Most other banks are unlike Silicon Valley Bank. They're actually stronger today than they were one year ago. And remember, most banks are loan heavy. Silicon Valley Bank is securities heavy. It's easier to profit from loans when interest rates rise. The banks that are loan heavy, they're stronger now on average than any time in the past decade. Unlike Silicon Valley Bank's concentration in tech company customers, most banks have a diverse portfolio of customers. They're not exposed to the same concentration risk as Silicon Valley Bank. On merits alone, the U.S. banking system is not in trouble. The only fear, literally, the only fear is actually fear itself, right? Any sort of financial contagion that could occur it won't be based on banking fundamentals, but instead would be caused by the collective fear of American depositors. Our leaders have to ensure that that won't happen. And that's why they stepped in to save depositors at Silicon Valley Bank to make sure that everybody was made whole. Okay, so at this point, that is a pretty good explanation of how banks work, what happened at Silicon Valley Bank, what we might see over the next few days. That said, check out the article down in the show notes on Best Interest Blog. Check out the blog post if you want to see up-to-date stuff as it comes out this week. Thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Best Interest Podcast. If you have a question for Jesse to answer on a future episode, send him an email at jesse at bestinterest.blog. Again, that's jesse at bestinterest.blog. Did you enjoy the show? Subscribe, rate, and review the podcast wherever you listen. This helps others find the show and invest in knowledge themselves, and we really appreciate it. We'll catch you on the next episode of the Best Interest Podcast. The Best Interest Podcast is a personal podcast meant for education and entertainment. It should not be taken as financial advice and is not prescriptive of your financial situation.